In this section, we'll expand upon the ideas we generated in the last section and talk about the theoretical sampling distribution of the sample mean and its estimate based on a single sample. In the previous section, we reviewed the results of simulations that resulted in estimates of what's formally called the sampling distribution of a sample mean. The sampling distribution of a sample mean is a theoretical probability distribution. It describes the distribution of all sample means from all possible random samples of the same size taken from a population. For example, just to recall, this histogram that we looked at in the last section is an estimate of the sampling distribution of sample blood pressure means based on random samples of size 50 from the population of blood pressure measurements for all men. We estimated that by taking 500 random samples because it wouldn't be possible to take all possible random samples of size 50 and display the results. So what we see there is just an estimate of this underlying distribution that would include the sample means for every possible random sample. In real research, however, something you were probably thinking in the last section, it's impossible to estimate the sampling distribution of the sample mean by actually taking multiple random samples from the same population. No research would ever happen if we needed to do 500 studies every time we wanted to understand the sampling behavior. All you're ever going to do will end up doing research is taking one sample. So what we saw in the last section, the simulations, they're useful to illustrate a concept, but not necessarily to highlight a practical approach. So now we're going to try and segue from that illustrative simulation into how do we actually get a hold on this in the real world. Luckily, there is some mathematical machinery that generalizes some of the patterns we saw in the simulation results that we can estimate using information based on only one sample. The central limit theorem, sometimes called CLT by those in the know, is a powerful mathematical tool that gives several useful results. It basically tells us what would have happened in our simulations without us having to do them. And that's very powerful. It tells us in, up front, hey, you don't have to do multiple studies because I can tell you that the sampling distribution a sample means based on all samples of the same size n is approximately normal, regardless of the distribution of the original data in the population that you're sampling from. It tells me that the mean of all sample means in the sampling distribution is the true mean of the population from which the samples were taken. Yeah. And it also tells me that the standard deviation in the sample means of size n, it actually gives an explicit formula for that. It says it is equal to sigma, the true standard deviation of individual values in the population, divided by the square root of n. This quantity, this standard deviation in the sample means of size n, is actually called the standard error of the sample mean and sometimes written as se with an X bar in parentheses. This is huge if you think about it because this basically tells us everything we need to know about this sampling distribution without us having to do the simulations we did. It tells us it's going to be normal, it's going to be centered at the true mean, and here's what the spread in it is. And we'll see how to use this to our advantage in the upcoming sets of slides. Here I'm displaying the results of the simulations using 500 sample means and 5,000 sample means. And here you can see that the means of either 500 or 5,000 across all sample size studies, 20, 50, and 100, are all around 125 millimeters of mercury, the true population mean. And you can see that the sample standard deviation, for example, the 500 sample means based on samples of size 20, is similar to the sample standard deviation of the 5,000 sample means each based on 20, which are both similar to what they should be by the central limit theorem. In that last column, what I've done is taken the true standard deviation of the population values and divided by the square root of 20. And that's what the central limit theorem tells us, the standard deviation of all sample means from all possible random samples of size 20 will be. Our standard deviation of 500 and 5,000 sample means, respectively, are just estimates of that. You see they all line up pretty closely. Similarly for those based on n equals 50 and n equals 100. So let's just recap the central limit theorem. The CLT tells us the following. 
When taking a random sample of continuous measures of size n from a population with true mean mu and true standard deviation sigma, the theoretical distribution sampling distribution of sample means from all possible random samples of the same size n is given by a normal curve, which is centered at the true mean and has standard deviation equal to the variation in the individual values divided by the square root of the sample size that each mean is based on. So, what good is this info? Well, let's now bring in some properties of the normal curve and see what we can learn. If this curve tells us, had we taken every possible random sample of size n and computed any, every possible sample mean, the distribution of those sample means would be a normal curve centered at the truth. Using the properties of the normal curve, this shows that for most random samples, we can take 95% of the random samples we could take of size n, the sample means will fall within two standard errors of the true mean mu, and that's just using the property of the normal distribution. So again, what well, good is that info? If we knew the truth, we wouldn't care what would happen under imperfect estimates of the truth, right? And furthermore, we're only going to take a single sample of size n and get one x bar. We can't take multiple samples. So we won't know mu, and if we did know mu, why would we care about the distribution of the estimates of mu from imperfect subsets? If we knew the mean, we wouldn't be doing any of this, right? Well, again, think of it this way. We are going to take a single sample of size n and get one x bar. But these results from the central limit theorem coupled with the properties of the normal curve mean that for most of the random samples we could take, the x bar we get will fall within plus or minus two standard errors of mu. And standard error is the term we give to the standard deviation of sampling means to distinguish it from the standard deviation of individual values. So we take a single random sample, and most of the samples we could get will have a mean that will sample mean that will fall within two standard errors of mu. So what does that mean? Well, that means conversely, if we started our sample mean estimate from the single sample we've taken and goes two standard errors in either direction from that, the interval we create will contain mu most about 95% of the time. Such an interval formed by taking our best guess for a population mean from a single sample, a sample mean, and going two standard errors in either direction is called a 95% confidence interval for the population mean mu. And that interval will be given by taking the result from a single sample, x bar, and adding and subtracting two standard errors of x bar, or x bar plus or minus two times sigma over the square root of n. But there's an inherent flaw in this, right? We don't know sigma either. That's a population quantity that, of course, if we're doing the study and taking an imperfect subsample, we're not going to know that either. Well, what we're going to see in the next section is, well, we can estimate that using the sample standard deviation. But before we get to the point of estimating these, let's think about what the interpretation of such an interval is. One way to think of this is sort of the layperson's perspective or the intuitive perspective is this will give us a range of plausible values for the true mean. We're going to take a single sample, get an estimate for the true mean that suffers from sampling variability. In order to build in sampling variability to the story, we put this range of uncertainty around our best guess and get an interval that gives a range of plausible or likely values for the true mean, which we can't see based on the results from our sample. Technically speaking, what a 95% confidence interval means is were we to take 100 random samples of the same size from the same population and create a 95% confidence interval for the mean from each of these 100 samples, the 95 of the 100 intervals we got would contain the value of the true mean mu within the endpoints. So 5% of the samples we could take would miss that truth within the endpoints, and the other 95% would contain it. So here's a picture. Here's 195% confidence intervals from 100 random samples of size n equals 50 in the blood pressure example. And I've just plotted that, and I've put on the graph a horizontal line at 125 millimeters of mercury, which is the true mean. And it's hard to see. There's a lot of information on this graph. You probably won't be able to see it on your printed slides, but on the screen you see, can see that all the intervals colored in black cover 
the 125 or the true mean. And then there's five intervals in red that do not. Now, one thing to think about with this idea of accounting for sampling variability vis-a-vis -vis this confidence interval and employing the tricks of the central limit theorem so that we don't have to repeat a study multiple times, but we can use what it tells us from mathematics and build upon it, is that all we're accounting for is sampling variability. The idea that because samples are imperfect representations, even if they're representative of the population from which we've taken them, they're going to have slightly different subsets of values and hence lead to slightly different estimates of the same quantity. Confidence interval only accounts for this random sampling error. It doesn't account for other sources of error, and this is important to remember. It's not a panacea for a bad study. So, for example, if we had a broken sphygmomanometer and the blood pressure measurements we were getting were consistently too high, confidence interval is not going to address that source of error. Or suppose only those with high blood pressure agree to participate in our study. So the sample we get is not necessarily representative of the original population we wanted to study. Confidence interval is not going to address that. So it can only, only get at sampling error. Are all confidence intervals 95%? Certainly not. It's the most commonly used. But you could create a 99%, for example, or a 90%. A 99% will be wider than a 95%. A 90% will be narrower. To change the level of confidence, you can just adjust the number of standard errors added and subtracted to the sample mean. For a 99% confidence interval, you need plus or minus 2.6 standard errors. For a 95% confidence interval, you need plus or minus 2. As we've seen, 90% you would need plus or minus 1.65. It's a terrible semantic in statistics, so I just want to reintroduce it here, what we mean when we say standard deviation colloquially versus standard error. When you hear somebody refer to the standard deviation, they're referring to the variability in individual observations in a single sample or population. Generally, they're referring to the sample standard deviation, which estimates the variability in the population using the data in the sample. The standard error of the mean is also a measure of standard deviation, but it's not standard deviation of individual values, rather the variation in multiple sample means computed on multiple random samples of the same size taken from the same population. So standard error is definitely a type of standard deviation, but not applied to individual values, but to summary statistics on sets of individual measures. In the next section, we'll actually show now how to turn all this theory into practice and actually estimate intervals based on the single sample of data and interpret them.